Welcome to Eastern Europe's Minorities in a Century of Change, a podcast on the history of minority experiences in Central and Eastern Europe during the 20th century. I'm Dr. Samuel Foster, co-organizer for the Bassis Group Study Group for Minority History. The series is part of the Institute of Historical Research's Centennial Commemorations, Our Century, Looking Back, Thinking Forward, and has been organized by the study group. It was made possible through the help and support of the British Association of Slavonic and East European Studies and the Stanley Burton Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the University of Leicester. The study group is a forum devoted to researching minorities in the national and regional histories of Central, Eastern and Southeast Europe and promoting closer scholarly collaborations. For more information, please visit our website at studygroupforminorityhistory.com. On this episode, Tamara Scheer, lecturer in East European and Contemporary History at the University of Vienna, talks to us about diversity and the various conflicting loyalties in the Austro-Hungarian military during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Tamara, welcome to the podcast. Can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in this area of history? Yes, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to be invited and to share my research with this audience. So thank you very much. Um, and a warm welcome from rainy November, Vienna. Um, I'm Tamara Scheer. I was born in Vienna in a part which is, was, which is called Ottakring, uh, which I experienced from early childhood on diversity. So uh, as for people coming from uh, this hood in uh, Vienna, it's quite normal uh, to, to have neighbors and friends and schoolmates who are originally from different countries, not only in Europe, but over the world, speaking different languages and having different um, religions. Um, this is why I was, uh, since early childhood, very much interested in diversity, um, different fields of diversity, and thus uh, it brought me to, when studying, studying history at the University of Vienna, to do some kind of research on that. But first of all, I was more interested in the First World War, so to say, so my MA and my PhD thesis were about the War Surveillance Office in Austria-Hungary during the First World War, so the World Surveillance Office was set up um, to manage and organize um, the state of emergency. So it was something about censorship and curfews and travel restrictions. So things in 2003, nobody had a clue about how this could, uh, could work in daily life. But uh, for the last uh, two years, because of COVID, we now all know how it is uh, to manage travel restriction and Am I allowed to do this or that? And no, and rules are changing all the time. So this was my MA and PhD thesis. And what, what was becoming very interesting is that, of course, it was a state of emergency and it was during war, but Austria-Hungary and has some kind of special, um, Austria-Hungary structure and diversity has some kind of special impact because of all these different languages and nationalities and so on. So, from the very first, uh, with my first research projects, I became very much interested in that. Uh, my first postdoc uh, brought me to Budapest. I was working at first like at Andrasi University, and there was doing research on the soundtrack of Novi Pasa, where Austria-Hungary um, sent troops. I mean, it was still Ottoman and not a part of the Ottoman Empire, but um, um, but not as in Bosnia, had the governor, where Austria-Hungary also set up own administration. There was still an Ottoman administration there. So it was, um, I was investigating this, um, this little microcosm of Balkan, of the Balkans, because it's, uh, it neighbored in the South Bosnia, had the governor. So it was, it was my first postdoc study. And also something more about First World War, I did research on it was Austro-Hungarian occupation regime. Um, so what you can see is that I was always interested in the military and Austria-Hungary. Um, so, and this brought me to the idea um, when it came up with uh, what to do with habilitation topics. So habilitation is still required in Austria if you want to teach and become a professor. And so I picked um, the language diversity in the Austro-Hungarian army. So starting with the given constitutions and the compromise between Austria and Hungary in 1867, 
and ending with the end of the First World War in 1918. Um, I think this will also be the topic we will majorly or mainly discuss today. Thank you. And um, for the benefit of our listeners, where was Austria-Hungary? What set it apart from other European countries during this period? And why have historians typically emphasized its ethnic, religious and linguistic diversity as being an increasingly important factor during its final decades? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, I think um, there is no yes and no answer. So I'm um, constantly asked, so why do you think Austria-Hungary was a special country or how and in which sense did it differ from other European countries or from other states at that time? So we're speaking about the late 19th century up to 1918. Uh, well, it differed and on the other hand, it differed not. So, uh, but what it had, and I think this is something um, Austria-Hungary really characterized, it was a great awareness about diversity and it was a diversity which was not only due to uh, daily experience and daily interaction, but from the starting with the compromise and the constitutions in Austria-Hungary, it was also, um, uh, it had some legality. So um, in the Austrian constitution, uh, there had been attached the article 19. So this was a fundamental civic right that you were allowed in Austria to use your language uh, in administration or in school. And it also had to be recognized in the army. So there was already a legal background that say, well, you are diverse by language and language was usually a marker or the most important marker for belonging to a nationality. So people were already aware with that, with their right. And so they had some kind of awareness that uh, their empire, their state, and finally Francis Joseph, the monarch, um, was very well aware of that. And they granted rights to them, in particular in situation when dealing with the administration. And the 19th century, this is really important, not only for Austria Hungary, but for countries all over Europe, uh, they ran some courses they called modernization. So and modernization was very much attached to um, make the administration, state administration on every level. So from, from imperial institution like ministries down to communities to make it more efficient. And if you want to be more efficient, you have to count your population as much as possible. And so you have to ask for their professions and the family size. And also very crucial for Austria, it was uh, for language and nationality. Oh, but they are only asked for which language they use in daily, daily life, but they then um, propagated it as belonging to nationality. Uh, what is maybe a bit special um, and not, um, so much comparable with other European countries is that Austria and Hungary had different constitutions. So I now uh, told you something about the Article 19 that granted the citizen rights, but there were no such rights in Hungary. So in Hungary, you had, and contrary to Austria, a so called state language that was Hungarian, but the only Hungarian was allowed to be used um, in administration. But however, people still use the other languages because Hungary was not less. Uh, diverse than Austria was. Uh, and also here people were very much aware of the diversity. And so they discussed that from a community level to province, provinces and the newspapers and media and everywhere. And maybe what was even more um, crucial for Hungarian citizens, so we had not only two constitutions, we also had two citizenships, like someone was an Austrian by citizenship or a Hungarian. So in Hungary, uh, these so-called minorities, like German minority, or but it was especially German minority or Croatian minority, they were very well aware of the citizen rights in Hungary. And so for them, they also discussed, like, why are we not allowed to have these rights, but only because we're um, Hungarian or Hungarian citizens? Uh, so I think this is uh, what made up Austria-Hungary a special case, but it does not mean that not other uh, European countries were... Um, characterized by diversity. Um, in contrary, when we think of the so-called so much German, German Reich, the Deutsches Reich, um, they had lots of Polish speakers living under their rule and also French speakers. So not only um, German speakers, um, but what, is, but I sometimes have the feeling is that um, 
Well, in Austria-Hungary, there was a public discussion going on on diversity and citizen rights and language rights. There was no such discussion and also no rights in, in, in the German Reich. Uh, what is important is, and I was really surprised when I found the discussion in Austrian newspapers at the end of the 19th century, when uh, not before that, in the German army, soldiers of Polish native tongue were allowed to wear the oath in their own language. People in Austria were really surprised, like saying, hey, this is, um, this is the rule in Austria since the compromise. So what? They did not let them uh, swear the oath in their own language. So probably this is also something why very often um, the diversity of Austria-Hungary is seen as something special. But maybe it was because people were just more aware or contemporaries were more aware of that. And it was just a bigger public discussion. And if I think of, um, for example, um, the British Army in India, uh, they also had some kind of uh, that officers had to learn the languages of the soldiers coming from there. So it was not that much um, of a difference when it comes to diversity if you compare Austria-Hungary with the rest of the world or Europe. Okay, so um, turning then to the Habsburg armed forces themselves, and you have, and you've sort of touched on this already, but um, just uh, again, just once again for the benefit of our listeners, how was the Austro-Hungarian military um, reorganized after eighty after this compromise of eighteen sixty seven that you mentioned, and um, what sort of role did languages act, uh, languages and linguistic diversity actually play in this reorganization process? Well, there's different uh, possibilities to answer to this question. If I would answer as a strict military or classical military historian, I would say, well, the army is usually interested in well-trained soldiers who are trained efficiently. So um, this is, was one main idea. The other idea was um, that after the compromise, uh, beforehand you had um, um, a professional soldier's army. So soldiers, to be a soldier was a job, like other jobs, which meant you just, uh, when you were young and you were looking for a job, you joined the army, like as an officer or NCO or as an ordinary officer. And then you usually did that job your entire life, if it was possible. But um, due to the modernization process, uh, and also part of this was that um, the new conviction all over Austria-Hungary, but also the rest of Europe was, one thing was that soldiers should be no longer drilled, like educated, so they should know what they are fighting for and what they are doing and so on. So no longer drilled, it was one notion, uh, which was called modern in the 1860s. And the other thing is um, that um, especially, um, especially after the French occupation of the early 19th century and then the revolutions all over Europe in the 40, 1848, um, there was um, most of the army leadership was convinced that uh, a volunteer army is the future, not professional armies. And what did that mean? So they, um, together with the constitutions in 1867, they uh, implemented common conscription in Austria-Hungary, which meant the size of the army and the number of the soldiers within um, a couple of months, like rose rose in a way to a number, uh, a size that uh, had never been like that before in Austria-Hungary. So uh, if we now say that we had common conscription um, and the soldiers had to serve to, for three years in active duty and also in reserve for another 10 years, it meant um, that they had to be, um, they had um, not that much time that before when it was a professional army to train them. And this was also something, the idea like then officers and NCOs had to speak the languages. But also, as I said already before, all these, um, these citizen soldiers had the right to use the language when they come into contact with administration and there was also the army included. And so um, there was uh, the, the, the army leadership was convinced that the need for an army reform right after the constitutions were given and the compromise. Our uh, first was, um, maybe I should say that too, maybe it's also a particularity of Austria-Hungary, that after the compromise, Austria had more or less four armed forces. Like one was the so-called Count Car Joint Army that stretched all over Austria-Hungary and also recruited from all parts, um, also including Bosnia-Herzegovina after the 1880s. 
And then there were two territorial defenses, the so-called Hornbetschig, which was only allowed to operate during peacetime on own soil, so like only in Hungary, and the Kaka Landswehr, which was the counterpart of the Hornbetschig and was responsible for Austria. And somehow the fourth armed force was the Navy. Uh, the Navy also recruited from all over Austria-Hungary. Um, what else can be said about the language used? So the, the joint army, as I said, the biggest one, um, so which stretched all over, which recruited from all over Austria-Hungary and held garrisons also all over Hungary, Austria-Hungary. Um, it implemented the citizen rights by saying, if someone has to do his uh, military service for three years, he is allowed to use his language when being trained and when being in contact with officers and NCOs. So, which is really interesting in that way, um, this language right is that it was extended on Hungary, which uh, knew no, so the Hungarian constitution knew no such right, in, which meant there was a huge discussion going on why, um, for example, there is a garrison in Hungary where now um, soldiers uh, or Hungarian citizen soldiers learn that their language have rights. So, you find that quite often this phrase in the political discussion in Hungary. So, that um, uh, so um, the Austrian territorial defense also granted this Austrian uh, citizen right, while in Hungary only Hungarian was allowed for, 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 for the correspondence and for the communication between the soldiers and, uh, uh, and the officers. Um, but it was, uh, and there was also the idea, and as I said before, it's like um, really the military is interested in efficient training. So. From the very first, there were some exceptions uh, from the language right. There was the so-called language of command. Uh, the language of command was in German, which meant that every citizen soldier had to commemorate about 80 terms of phrases in German. It's just like, look to the right, look to the left, something like you cannot when you're being combat, like translating in all the other languages. So the army leadership said, well, it's really important that we have these commands at least in one language. And this was the army lingua franca German. And there was also the so-called service language. So uh, the service language uh, was usually used, and it was also German, usually used uh, in correspondence between uh, different um, military institutions. And it was also the uh, language of daily rights to be used among officers. Um, except when they had spare time, but it was uh, the so-called, so it did not really affect the soldiers. So they all had, uh, the soldiers had this right to be used, but there were restrictions from the very first, which was, which was something like, I concluded in my habilitation, uh, most stemming not from nationalist convictions, rather from laziness and convenience, uh, which meant uh, that sometimes if you just, uh, have an officer who doesn't properly speak the language, but you have no other officer who, for example, speaks Polish or Ruthenian who is free at a certain point in time. They just uh, left this poor officer training Polish speaking soldiers. But usually if you really dig deep in the archive, nationalist convictions like saying, oh, these soldiers have to learn German or something like that because it's the most important language. No, it was usually convenience um, and not nationalist conviction. Well, at least many of these soldiers had the right uh, to use their language during military service, but they never got it granted. Um, thank, thank you. Um, so just thinking maybe, yeah, and again, you've, you've sort of touched on this a little bit. So, but uh, just generally, what sort of impact did you, do you think the, um, the implementation of this um, military language system actually had on the uh, sort of everyday experience, day-to-day -day experiences of sort of the the rank and file, so to speak, um, for whom uh, specifically those outside of the officer class for whom this kind of ref this sort of reform was primarily aimed at, and um, then, and then sort of drawing back a bit further, uh, how do you think this generally shaped uh, more public perceptions of the Habsburg military as an institution, especially among non-Germans and non-Hungarians? 
Well, for me, it was really interesting when doing this research, and thanks to two really major research grants uh, from uh, the Austrian Science Foundation, I was able to dig deep in archives all over former Habsburg monarchy for, well, it's now almost 10 years. So the first thing was, I mean, usually everybody is citing um, officers as biographical sources because they're ma more, much easier to find and they are more often preserved in archives. So the first challenge was just to figure out how an ordinary conscript experienced this diversity during his military service. That was not that easy. And the other thing is uh, not only uh, covering the languages I can work with, but also to gain really an overview over the whole uh, Habsburg monarchy. Uh, and the interesting thing is like <laughs> daily life is usually not not written down. So this was really a problem with sources. But after 10 years, as Emma would say, I managed uh, to get this bridge. Uh, but the thing is, if you look, for example, only on the political discussion in either Vienna's parliament or Budapest parliament, you somehow get the notion that none of these soldiers were ever granted uh, their language right properly, that they were always dissatisfied and um, because of that, they never were able to identify with the army or the joint state or with the monarch. And uh, if you then figure out what was going on on a daily basis in the garrison, uh, this was not the case. I mean, of course, there had been soldiers who were already very much politicized. And so they really experienced it that way, like how it was portrayed and brought up by nationalist uh, politicians in the parliament. But usually, and this is also one of my, I would say, core findings of my research project, it was like, it was not so much uh, that uh, their officers or NCOs properly spoke the languages, but that they had some kind of feeling that they at least try, or that at least the monarch tried to, um, to, to grant the right properly. And but there was another thing which I then would say was the most important finding is like what they identified with on a daily basis for the soldiers and even for a long time after they had finished the army service is like they identified with diversity. So they identified with um, we, have, we, have, we speak so many languages, we have so different uh, religions, but what make up the we, uh, what we identify with is the diversity and, and diversity also included that language right can never um, introduce um, perfectly in such, uh, in such uh, an army and state which is so much characterized by diversity. And I would say it's not, it was not as it was always called by army propaganda and the monarch propaganda like wearing the emperor's coat and a double eagle with which uh, they identified, but they identified with this mixing of languages. And uh, so something like, we can always find a way to communicate and as long as we communicate, it's fine. And um, just as a sort of quick follow up to that last question, um, you mentioned briefly kind of, a, there was a sense in some quarters, there was a sense of resentment. Would you say that was generally more pronounced in, um, military regiments that were commanded by Hungarians, given the kind of disparities between the two portions of the monarchy? Well, the thing is, and we have to clearly distinguish between the Hungarian um, check, so the territorial defense and the joint army. The joint army for a long time, and it was something like the army ship leadership never knew how to um, organize it perfectly, because as soon as you changed your mindset and the rules and additional problems came up. So for example, from 86 and seven onwards, um, it was normal for officers that they had to change garrison after about three years. So they were then transferred, transferred to work with soldiers of totally different uh, language background than before in a different part of Austria-Hungary. So this was some kind of rule because the army leadership wanted to avoid that, for example, someone or a Hungarian and Hungarian, ethnic Hungarian stays for too long with Hungarian soldiers within Hungary. So they, they 
discussed to change that because what was then what then came out is that they had not so much native speakers of Hungarian among the officers, but even these few they usually sent to Bosnia or to Tyrol or to Polish speaking parts of Austria Hungary. So they then discussed like should we really do that because it counters uh it counts it it, it it really harshens our administration. But then they came up with no, because we want to avoid that they um, identify too much with that. And then we have these problems like Hungarians commanding only Hungarians, Hungarians are only serving together with Hungarians. Uh, so there was some kind of discussion going on until uh, the outbreak of the war. Uh, but what they had, and uh, so at the moment I did not mention it, and I call them there. So I, I now, was mostly speaking about professional officers. The professional officers were coming from all over the monarchy and they all had to speak German, but there were always some languages missing like among, among these professional officers like Ruthenian or Polish or Hungarian. So you needed links, uh, links between the ordinary conscripts and uh, the officers, the professional officers. And usually um, these language gaps were bridged by uh, the NCOs on the one hand, who usually came from the same region as the conscript, so they knew the languages, languages, and also with reserve officers, because there was also the status of reserve officer implemented uh, with the army reform following the constitution and the compromise in 1867. Okay, so thinking about all of this then in the build up to, and then following the outbreak of the First World War, um, how effective were these efforts in dealing with this linguistic diversity and um, what might have seemed, particularly from the sort of commanders and politicians in the monarchy, the potentially divided loyalties of the rank of the rank and file when this was placed in the context of an actual modern industrial conflict um, and particularly kind of the more extreme um, the more extreme conditions the Habsburg military had to operate, notably um, against the Italian army on the Isonzo front. I mean, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, you started with 19th century and now it's a it's First World War. I, I didn't got it correctly, I guess. Oh, sorry. I mean, um, so once the, what I meant was once the, um, the military, the Austro-Hungarian military had to actually engage in a modern conflict, the, e.g. the First World War, um, how did this kind of system manage? How did the system hold up, if you like? Was it, what were kind of the sort of strains and pressures placed on it during this kind of conflict, particularly as the war kind of drags on and the casualty rates increase and the monarchy faces more and more difficulties? Well, interestingly, um, up to, I would say, the turn of the century, so 1900, there was almost no discussion or internal ministerial discussion or within the army high command of um, how this system would, would prove itself in a modern conflict. Um, these uh, ideas about um, what to do during a war or modern conflict started um, at around the turn of the century, and it accelerated uh, when there were two partial mobilizations um, during the First and the Second Balkan Wars. So then they uh, got to know, okay, how, what, what should we do um, when uh, these languages are still mixing up, the units are mixing up, and in particular, if we had to uh, wage a war against an enemy, whose soldiers more or less speak the same languages as our soldiers do, like which happened with Italian speakers from the Habsburg monarchy at the Italian front, but also and even more crucial, like um, South Slavic speakers at uh, the Bal Balkan front. Okay. Um, so then jumping forward in time again, we've arrived in the autumn of 1918 um, and Austro-Hungary has effectively collapsed. Um, we see kind of new states are starting to emerge um, as these various territories start to secede, uh, often using language as a kind of, um, as a sort of means of legitimizing their succession from the monarchy. Um, but 
sort of thinking about all of these reforms and their legacies, do you did did kind of the Habsburg militaries attempt to um, sort of, um, if you like, uh, create some kind of cohesion between these different um, uh, these different uh, lang uh, languages? Um, did that have any kind of lasting legacy in within these new states themselves, uh, particularly kind of the those sort of multi-ethnic successor states such as Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia? Do you see any kind of lasting legacy? Well, I think it depends on the respective successor states. So I myself had a closer look or better did some research on um, how the army on then uh, um, limited Austria after 1918, how they hired their officers and uh, there is personnel files and also job applications available in the Austrian state of in Vienna. And what uh, surprised me most is how former professional Habsburg officers who applied for a job in um, post-war Austria tried to somehow fix their CV to be more suitable and to be more successful to be again uh, an officer in the Republican army. And just for one example is if you, and this is really nice because you can look on the documents right exactly in the same reading room and you have their personnel files from before 1918, where they highlight all their language knowledge and how many languages they speak, where they went to school, where they grow up, because this kind of also diversity from a personal point of view was usually a guarantor for a successful army career. So as many languages you knew, as more places you have lived in, the better was it for your career. And if you then looked on the application when you tried to get a job in the Republican Austrian Army after 1918, they really dropped a lot of information, like the same officer who beforehand spoke five languages afterwards says, no, I went to school, had German classes, I only spoke German at home, I taught my children only German. So they seemingly, they thought in, in this, um, which sometimes was called it somehow a successor army of the Habsburg monarchy, was really only looking for German speakers or better real German uh, to be hired. Um, there was a different sense uh, or different politics going on all over. And I think most of the successes states, like let's say Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and also Hungary, not Hungary is a special case, but Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia, but also Italy. So I, I wouldn't call Italy a successful state, but at least it got lots of former regions and Italian speakers. And there was a good book coming out a couple of years ago. It was called Tra Due Divise, which means between two uniforms. So, and it was this special situation of that you had in Italy, uh, those former soldiers and officers who fought for the kingdom of Italy. And but then had also um, um, former soldiers who fought at the First World War who suffered. Um, but um, this is Tra Due Divisia, means between two uniforms, but they wore a different uniform. And this is how um, all these also veteran movements and commemoration really um, influenced, sometimes even still, still today in Italy, um, the commemoration of the First World War, so this division. And in Yugoslavia, just one, um, um, one term always comes up in my mind is Nostali. So uh, mostly Serbian, um, oh, these officers and soldiers who fought for Serbia during the First War, they used to call all the former Habsburg soldiers of Serbian or South Slav origin Naftali, which means they smell like the old uh, regime. Uh, in fact, uh, I would say uh, one of the most important political figures of Yugoslavia, like Tito, he was a Naftali himself because he was a really high ranking and very much awarded NCO for the Habsburg army during the First World War. And Czechoslovakia, on the other hand, uh, I remember a good article read, uh, uh, written by Jerzy Hudečko, who, who said there was this struggle, or there were even complaints by former Czech legionnaires who fought uh, from the very first against Austria-Hungary, but who themselves felt to be treated worse uh, when it came to jobs in the Czechoslovak army after 1918, because very many former Habsburg officers got the better job. 
Um, and so it, it, it's really something uh, you have to compare from different angles. But I would say there was the one situation. Hungary, on the other hand, um, was hiring, as far as I know, um, former Habsburg officers, uh, regardless of their um, nationality or native language. So lots of uh, Croatian origin officers, for example, from Zagreb, who got no job in, um, in the newly implemented Yugoslav army, they went to, to Budapest and then started working for the Honved ministry. So there was a huge um, also informal network between these former Habsburg officers going on, like how to help themselves out in these um, very complicated times. And also in the end of the Austrian state, you have lots of personal documents, memoirs, diaries and letters, which show how much they were still in contact. Um, after 1919 and really tried to help each other. Well, also uh, Miklos uh, Horvi, Horvi um, Hungary's interwar ruler, was himself a former admiral in the Austro-Hungarian Navy, so there was that as well. <laughs> um, so finally then, where can people go to learn more about this topic? <laughs> um, so that's the part where I should um, shamelessly <laughs> Um, promote away, uh, promote away, please do. <laughs> uh, well, I crucially decided a couple of years ago when starting to write my habilitation on language diversity and loyalty in the Habsburg Army to write it in English. Um, but I now finally decided um, the first published manuscript will be in German, but I uploaded the habilitation manuscript uh, open access on the repository of the University of Vienna. Um, so feel free to download and read it and comment it. Um, would be happy about suggestions and questions. Um, and I am also very much, uh, or at least I uh, try to uh, share my archival findings uh, on an everyday basis um, on social media. So if you're interested in the Habsburg Army or diversity and what challenges they pose on historians, so feel free to join me on Instagram Twitter or Facebook. And more seriously, let's call it academic social media. I've upload, uploaded almost all of my publication or at least the submitted versions on ResearchGate and Academia Edu. Samara Shear, thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Take care.